let me ask you this morning. What do you think God's plan is for the world and for the future? A while back, I was walking into a hospital, and I had a lady come up to me who believed she knew the plan God had for her family. See, she recognized I was a pastor, and she was very angry with her family at the time. She said to me, Judgment Day is coming, and I know they're going to get what's coming to them. This year is 2012. It's already a whole lot of talk that, you know, because of the Mayan calendar, perhaps on December 21st, it's all over. Bad things are going to happen. Let me just go on record as saying right now, I think December 22nd is going to roll around and everything's going to be the same as it was just right now. But these questions, these things that people put out there, they kind of make us think sometimes. What does God have in store for the future? What is God's plan? Well, would you believe me this morning if this was the answer to God's plan for the future? Some fish. Well, as we're going to see in the Word of God this morning, look to the fish to find the answer for God's plan in the future. Luke 24 today, again, finds Jesus appearing to the disciples after the resurrection. And once again, Jesus shows them His hands and He shows them His feet. He proves without a doubt He's truly risen. It's really Him. But did you catch in those words what the disciples were feeling at the time? Even though they were face to face with Jesus. It says in verse 37, they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. Pretty amazing, right? I mean, even though they're staring face to face at Jesus, they're still afraid. There's still doubts in their minds. And in fact, Jesus even has to ask them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? To the trouble the disciples are having, they don't quite get it. They don't really know what is so significant about Jesus rising. And they're not even particularly sure at this point it's even true. Maybe we can relate with the disciples just a little bit at this point. Do we really know what all this is about? I mean, sure, we know the story of Jesus, right? We know he died on the cross for us. We know he rose again from the dead. We know all the facts. But do we get how it applies to life? See, the disciples were struggling with that point. And maybe we do sometimes as well. I mean, ask yourself, how often does the resurrection of Jesus pop up in your daily thinking? How often is, is it a deciding factor in your attitude, or even how you interact with other people. I think we're honest this morning. We struggle with that a little bit, don't we? Sometimes, even though this is the biggest news possible, we forget that. And we go about our business as if the resurrection maybe never even happened. Well, that's where the disciples are at. So what's God's solution to this? What's the solution as we sort of go about life each day and see all of the problems around us? Well, that's where this whole point about the fish becomes so important for us today. Again, as we read on verse 42, we read the disciples gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it before them. So Jesus is shown clearly by his hands, by his feet, he's alive. But when the disciples still don't get it, he takes a piece of fish and he eats it before them. Now it's really tempting at this point to think, you know, that detail doesn't matter a whole bunch. Jesus eats some fish. That's, that's great. Moving on, let's see what else happens. But as we're soon going to discover, the fact that Jesus eats some fish is a big deal. It tells us exactly what God has in store for the future and what God has in store for his creation. So going on here in Luke, Jesus says this is all part of the plan, everything that transpired. He begins to open up the scriptures to his disciples. Verse 44 tells us, he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. 
See, to really understand what's so significant about eating this piece of fish, we too need to go all the way back to the beginning. We need to go back into the Old Testament. And there we find in the very first book, the book of Genesis, God created everything. God creates this whole world. He speaks it out of nothing. And he looks upon it. And in Genesis 1.31, it tells us that when God looked at his creation, he said it was very good. God loved what he made. It was wonderful. It was perfect. That tells us something about God. When we think about what God calls perfect, that includes the creation and includes us. God is not looking to wipe everything out. He's not looking to destroy everything. Far from it. Instead, God looked at it and he said, it's very good. Now we know it happened afterwards. Mankind fell into sin. And we see all around us the signs that this world is broken. There's crime. There's disease, there's poverty, there's worries and sickness, there's death, there's stress and heartache and frustration and brokenness all over the place. So what's God's plan to fix it? Well, many people would tell us his plan is just to destroy it all, right? Rain down judgment. Do something like he would do in the Old Testament. Wipe everybody out. When we talk about eternal life, people often talk, don't really talk about it as a new creation. They don't always talk about heaven possibly coming down to what God made. But the reality is that God desires to restore His creation. The reality is that God desires and plans to make things right, not wipe it out, but fix it. And there when Jesus ate that fish, we began to see what God had in mind. And when Jesus got out of the tomb, he was restored, right? His body was perfect. God raised him up and gave him life. And that clues us in as to what God desires to do with his creation. He loves it. He said it was very good. And God's plan now is to make it very good again. Some of you I know are into restoring old automobiles, old cars. In fact, there's a couple of you out here that maybe do that all the time, have that kind of as a hobby, as a side project. Why do people do it? Why not just go to the dealership and buy a new car, right? Out with the old, in with the new. Well, you restore the old car because it's a classic, right? And we love those old automobiles. There's just nothing quite like them. And you who do that sort of work, you know in the back of your mind, you can get that car looking just like it rolled off the assembly line back in the day. You know you can get it just right. Well, that's how God looks at his creation. That's how God looks at us. He doesn't need to wipe us all out. Instead, God knows he can, God knows he can restore it. He can make it perfect all over again. And the resurrection proves that to us. See, God took Jesus, and Jesus wasn't destroyed. He didn't become a ghost or a spirit or anything like that. His body was raised up. God restored him perfectly whole. He lives, and he even eats some fish to prove it, to show what God has in mind. That's the plan for the future. We saw a little of that unfold today in the book of Acts. The book of Acts today told us this really interesting and somewhat humorous story about a man that was lame from birth. That's what the text tells us. He couldn't move, couldn't do anything. Peter and John stumble across this man, and they heal him. And the humorous part of it is that after they heal him, the text tells us they, he literally clung to Peter and John. He says, hey, these guys restored my life. I'm not letting go of these guys, because... Through them, I got life. Through this Jesus, they're always proclaiming, I've been restored. Well, Peter explains to us what happened there in the book of Acts. He said, the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. That, my friends, is where our faith is going. Our faith is not leading us towards some dead end. 
In fact, our faith is leading us to be restored. Perfect health, perfect everything. John told us today, we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Because we shall see him as he is. Scripture says we're going to be like the resurrected Jesus. Well, look what he's doing here in Luke. He's walking and he's talking and he's interacting with his disciples. He's even eating some fish. Perfectly restored. That is what you and I are going to be. Your body is going to be something that God says is very good. Your whole life, this whole creation is going to be something that God says is very good. Now we know this sometimes, don't we? You've been out in the creation before. You maybe had one of those moments where you looked upon what God has made and you too said, very good. Maybe you've been out like in the sequoias or Yosemite. You look at all that beauty around there and you say, oh, this is very good. Perhaps you're more of a beach person. You know, you go out to the coast, look out at that ocean, those hills out there, and you say, oh, this is very good. That's what God says as well. God says to us, imagine if the whole world was like that. Imagine if everything, not just a few locations, but everything is perfect. Think about that for a minute. What if everything was perfect? What about here in this valley? What if there was no more smog? You could look out to those mountains, every single day and see them perfectly? What if there was no more allergies? No more drought? You know, you could grow your oranges, you could grow your, your crops and your garden, never have to worry about there being a lack of water ever again. Perfect, right? Imagine if you turn on the news and there's never any crime. You can put a door on your house and you don't even need a lock. Don't have to worry about a thing. Imagine if you never had to go to the doctor. If you're perfectly healed, Never sick, no headaches, no stress, no worries, no disease, and no death. That sounds great, right? Sounds sort of like a fairy tale, doesn't it? Maybe you're even thinking this morning, you know, Pastor, getting a little carried away here this morning. That's just too good to be true. Impossible. Believe it. Because God says that's going to be the reality. That is God's plan for the future to make everything and everyone perfect. How do we know? Because Jesus rose from the dead. We know because he rose from the dead, not as a ghost, not as a spirit, but as a guy who was eating some fish. But again, what does that mean for right now? What does it mean for everyday life? Well, it means a new attitude. So we all have things in life. There's not a person in this room who doesn't have bad times. Things they worry about. Things that maybe even keep you up at night. And a lot of times it's really easy to feel like there's no hope at all. To feel like everything is just spiraling out of control. But God tells us today to take on a new attitude. Tells us to have hope even in the midst of those trying times. Because if death couldn't destroy Jesus, it can't destroy you either. If Jesus is raised up, that's what you're going to be as well. Nothing can change that. Nothing can stop it. I shared with you a couple of years ago a story that was in the Lutheran Witness. Some of you might have read it. And I think it's a pretty powerful story. It's worth repeating because the attitude of the woman we encounter there exactly embodies what Christ's resurrection is all about. Megan and Peter Eckhart, they were a newly married couple, married only three months. And then Megan found out she had cancer. She battled that disease for 17 months. It wasn't pretty. It was tough. It was hard before she finally died. Her attitude throughout it all, though, was this. She wrote in her blog, because God has promised it. I will be blessed with a miracle, whether it be the healing of my body or Christ's perfect healing. Because Jesus lives. Because God plans to restore his creation. 
We can look at things in the same light. Nothing is going to destroy us. Death is not the final page or final chapter in our book. Instead, Christ is going to give us life. And we can march toward our problems. We can march into the doctor's office, into the hospital, even into the cemetery itself. No, that Christ will raise us up. Now, if that's the case, we can look at ourselves in a new light as well. You might have noticed on your bulletin cover this morning, there's a picture of a young girl. She's looking into the mirror, and she's got a Bible in front of her. She's reading the Bible there in front of that mirror. This picture helps us to understand how we should look at ourselves. It's really easy to let ourselves be defined by this world. And make no mistake, whenever we're defined by this world, it's never going to be a positive. Because what does this world always tell us? You're not good enough. You've got problems. You need to change something. You need to go on a diet. Or you need to get stronger. Or you need to get smarter. Or you need to get richer. Or you need to do this. Or you need to do that. You need to somehow get younger. Or if you're young, well, somehow you need to grow up and be more mature. There's always something we've got to change, right? We're always told, you're not good enough. But you think about this girl looking into that mirror. And she's not looking into that mirror, seeing herself in the world's eyes, or maybe even seeing herself in her own eyes. Instead, she's seeing herself in the light of God. See, God invites us today because Jesus is resurrected, because God says his whole creation is very good to look at ourselves the same way. In Jesus Christ, you are somebody that God says is very good. That's how God looks at you. John told us today the kind of love God has for us. We get to be called children of God. That is who we are. And you might look in the mirror in the morning or before you go to bed at night, and you might say, oh, I don't like that person staring back at me. That person looks kind of weird. That person's got problems and all kinds of mistakes and sin in their life. But because of Jesus Christ, God looks at you in a different light. God says, very good. God says, here is my child, the one that belongs to me. And with that said, not only do we get to look at ourselves in a new light, but it also means we're going to look at each other and a whole new life. In fact, Jesus told his disciples as much. As he continued on there, Luke, he opened up the scriptures to show them what God's plan was. And he said this affects what they do every single day. He told them that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. Think about the people you know in your life. And think about this world around you. Do they have a lot of good news all the time? Maybe not, right? a lot of bad news out there. It's very easy to get focused completely on the bad news. But look at what God has given to us. God has entrusted to you and I this message of the gospel. That in Christ we can see ourselves a whole new way. In Jesus Christ, God is going to restore everything. We need to take that message out into the creation. we got to get that message past these walls and past these doors to the people in our lives. And we need to start looking at people in a different light. If God looks at us through Christ and He says, very good, well, what are we going to say about each other? What are we going to say about the people in this room, every single one of them? Are we going to say what God says, very good? Or are we going to continue to sort of judge people? To size them up how we think, or maybe hold grudges, or get angry, or think about them in the wrong light. What are we going to do with those people outside these doors? We're going to love them the way that God has loved them? Look at them as somebody who can be restored, can be changed? Or will we take on the, the old cliches and say, oh, so and so will never change? So and so will never believe? See, for us as God's people, those words should never be in our vocabulary. When it comes to God, the word never should never be in our vocabulary. Well, today, 
take a look at God's word that you'll never be able to eat fish or go fishing the same way again. I hope that even just, just for a moment, you'll think about God's plan for the future. A plan to restore the whole creation. A plan to restore you and me to perfection. We get now to look at ourselves in a new light. We get to look at each other in a whole new light. We get to see it. Simply because Jesus is risen. And he was eating some fish. Let's go to God now. Heavenly Father, we thank you again that during this time of year we reflect on your Son's resurrection and all that it means for us. Lord, help us now to rejoice and take heart that Christ is going to restore everything to perfection. Your creation is going to once again be very good. Help us, Lord, to see ourselves through that same lens. Help us, Lord, to see each other in the same way that we might be people who share this good news of the world. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen.